Where did we leave off? It's So I guess that may be where we are. So me and Miss Pam did get back Sunday afternoon around 3 o'clock. Oh gosh, yeah. Alaska is an amazing state. It's awesome, beautiful. So I recommend everybody go. <laughs> it'll, it'll make you want to stay there. And I did think about it for that long. <laughs> and I got five grand back, back in the States for a lower 48, so that, I didn't think about it too long, but it is a gorgeous place, and I'd certainly recommend that you go. So. <clears throat> So we did get back Sunday afternoon at 3, and then the first thing you'd ask was, well, why didn't you make it to church Sunday night? After being up 32 hours, I could have slept here or there. <laughs> so we didn't make it Sunday, Sunday night. So we got off the boat uh, Saturday morning, and then um, we had to do the airport and flight delays time changes. We finally made it home. It's good to be back. Um, I can Was say it one week. Was out there? Again? Was it this cool out there? Um, mid 60s, low 60s, and 40s. <laughs> well, y'all had a change coming home, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, it was a even even when we got to Atlanta, it was a big, big change, a big difference. Well, I could tell lots of stories about Alaska, but that's not what we're here to not do. So I see Miss, Miss Dana is with us tonight. Me and Miss Dana go way back. So I have a I have a Dana story. It is. We all remember what we were doing on nine one one, don't we? I mean, every one of us could think back, like, what was I doing? Who was I talking to? I was talking to Dana Larson on the phone, and I don't have a clue what we was talking about. But um, I remember that just like yesterday, of course. That I was in my office, and I was talking to Dana on the phone. And... Uh, I guess at the time it was Bertie was my secretary, so she come to the door and said, my plane has just flown into the World Trade Center. And I told Dana, 
I'm going to call you back. <laughs> and whether I did or not, I don't remember that either. But uh, anyway, that's my Dana story. Uh, I was I was talking to you the day that the planes flew into the World Trade Center. I will never forget that. It's an indelible impression, of course. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to finish up Daniel chapter 3, hopefully tonight, and then um, move on to chapter 4. And so um, I've missed the last two Wednesdays. So just to get up to speed, this is the, the story, of course, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were thrown into the burning fiery furnace because they wouldn't bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's uh, image. And so these three guys had high positions in government. They had been promoted and they were to cast me out. I mean, they had power, they had status, and they certainly had wealth. They, they had just wealth. walked over all the other wise men. They they did so because Daniel, right, you know, had uh, interpreted the dream, and Nebuchadnezzar was extremely impressed because his other charlatans couldn't do that, and so he promotes uh, Daniel to the prime minister. Of course, that would be equivalent to what Joseph wound up doing in Egypt, right? He was promoted to prime minister, so Daniel was promoted to prime minister. Now, he's second in command. I mean, only Nebuchadnezzar has more authority and power than him, and so he promotes Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because he knows their character, and everything was going quite well. Now, they're doing their jobs well, which is a, a good Christian testimony, right? You want to be the best employee wherever it is that you work. John is self-employed, so I'm sure you're the best. I am. You're back <laughs> He quits every once in a while. I'm like, are you serious? You're I can pick on Miss Ellen. You ought to be the best at the bank. I'm, yeah. Good Christian. There is nothing worse than a slacker at work. That is a bad testimony. You know, wait all the time. Don't pull your weight. But anyway, uh, these three boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, had been promoted. They had status. They had wealth. They had position. They had power. And so here they are, and they're being accused of being disloyal to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar drags them in. Tell me it ain't so, boys. I'm going to give you another chance. When you hear the, the music play, bow down. And if not, into the furnace you go. And of course they said, not today. Not tomorrow either. And of course we went through a, like a dialogue. I mean, you can just hear the the back and two, right? Nebuchadnezzar was like, wait a minute now. I have given you guys all this wealth and privilege and position and power. And, you know, I'm only asking for this one little simple request here to help promote my religious unity and all. You know, you're all politicians now. You know, I can't have people in your positions not obeying my rules and if it was a matter of something that didn't touch on scripture they would have done it they were at the party weren't they mm -hmm. I mean there was no harm there no foul there because that didn't violate no conscience that didn't violate no biblical principle to be at the party but when it come time to bow down to a, another god or an image to another god that's where the line got drawn. And so it is that in our lives, we obey the rules, you obey the law, buckle up, stop at a dead stop, and you come to a stop sign. I mean, that's who the said it? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, who does that? 
And uh, 55 is the speed limit. And my good friend Terry Murray, he does drive 55. One time. <laughs> in a hurry going right on back. As it goes by, one time. Terry has got to be a descendant of Jehu. <laughs> Remember Jehu, he's he's tearing it up with his chariot and they, they see him coming and, and Jezebel says, that's got to be Jehu because he drives furiously. <laughs> and so Terry's got to be a descendant of Jehu. But we obey the rules, right? We obey the laws of the land up to the point that it violates what God's word has to say. And that's where we draw the line. And so that's exactly what has happened here. And so these three boys, I know, ain't going to do that. Ain't going to bow down. Well, he flips his crown, right? And in verse 19, it says he's full of fury. You catch up on my notes now. And I can see where he would be full of fury like that because he is just demoted all these others and put these boys up ahead of them. Yeah, don't you know those other guys were like yeah. giddy, right? Uh, and, and they were watching. Oh, yeah. They were watching closed. Hey, yeah. they ain't doing it. And that's another good point to make too, right? We're being watched. Mm-hmm. That's right. Being watched. But Nebuchadnezzar is full of fury and the expression on his face changes toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. He is ill. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar is crossed. <laughs> he is beyond that. He is furious. He's a proud man, and he certainly doesn't take disobedience very well. In his mind, this is defiance. This is treasonous. They had turned down his generous offer, so now they got to pay. Nebuchadnezzar is like, he's got no choice. They have defied the king, and they have done it publicly. Publicly. It's another good point to make. People don't know what you are in public. Not much of a testimony. Right. So I went to lunch one time with a colleague. This was years and years ago. So I sat down at lunch and I said, if you don't mind, I'll say grace. And this person said to me, well, I've already said grace. I said it under my breath. I said, okay. What a testimony. Or a testimony. So to Kyle's point, the Chaldeans, they're smiling broadly, ain't it? It's just plain remarkable that nothing is recorded of the Chaldeans' response to these three Hebrew boys. Wouldn't they be at least amazed at the stand that these boys took? Do you think they may have thought, would I have had the courage to do that? But I've had the faith to take a stand like that. See, we have to get the feel for what these boys, what the stakes were. They had good paying jobs, right? Mm -hmm. Position, status, power. They, they had it all, basically. Limousines and jet airplanes and, you know, all the perks. Well, camels and <laughs> and they were willing to give it up. We take, you know, we take it for granted or say the flippant, um, say flippantly life or death situation. You know, say what we would do or wouldn't do. They were in a, I mean, true life. I mean, how many of us get in a true life, you know, life or death situation? You know what I'm saying? And stand for well, you know, being bold to stand. Likely we haven't. So that's what makes this so weighty, right? So we do have to ask our question, our, our own selves. 
would we be up for that? Would we have the courage? Would we have the faith to take that kind of stand? Particularly when you're, let's say your middle career and you've got some promotions and you're lining yourself up for other promotions and you're doing the right things. And you've got three kids in school, slaving for college. I mean, you've got a plan in your mind and then something like this happens and you're like, oh, Maybe just this one time I'll. And that's all it takes. Compromise. So we don't see any response from these Chaldeans, but we do read Nebuchadnezzar's response. So he heats his furnace up seven times hotter than uh, normal. So he's seven times madder, and he's seven times hotter than he was in verse 13. I don't know if I mentioned it, but the furnace was built to smelt iron ore. And that was the purpose of it. And so, you know, you mine the ore and you put it in the furnace and that melts the metal, right? And it runs out into a trough and you can make it hotter by adding more fuel in their case, it could have been louder not stumps already, or coal or tar or something, but the, they had portholes in it so that they could blow air into it too. You know, they had the old fashioned billows where there's, they could pump air into it and then that would make it hotter. And so for some metals like bronze and copper, you had to get it hotter than greater iron to get, get it come out. Anyway, it was, so there was an opening at the top that was throwing in you know, the wood and fuel. And uh, that's where the three Hebrew boys was brought in. The openings in the side were necessary for the smelters to see the progress, add fuel if it needed to, or add air if it needed to. So the furnace was at least large enough for four men to walk around because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went into the furnace and then Nebuchadnezzar jumps up, right? And he says, looking through these portals, I see four. So into the fire, they went. And they were bound, they had to took the coats and tied them to the socks and everything. And I was thinking, you know, it's one thing you fix to face a torturous condition, but to be bound where you can't do nothing. That was supposed right. to add to the misery. Yeah, I mean, you're helpless. Yeah. And that all played out more, even better for Shadrach, Meshach, and him. And it could be that their feet were bound too because I mean, if you're going to throw somebody in something like that, they're usually not going to go quiet. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm probably going to be squirming some. <laughs> I mean, you may throw me in there, but, you know, I'm, I'm thinking this is going to leave a mark. <laughs> this is going to be painful. So they would basically grab you by the arms and the legs, right, to throw you in. And they can't really do that if your arms aren't bound and feet bound. So likely their hands and their feet were bound. But they were fully clothed, they had on their turbans, and they had ropes, and into the fire they go seven times hotter. Now it seems to me that if you really wanted to torture these guys for their rebellion, the furnace would have been cooled down, not heated up. Yeah, seven times hotter, it's going to be an instant death. That'll melt your skin right off. First time you take a, a breath, it would just annihilate your lungs, and it would be instant, basically instant death. But if you really want to hurt somebody and torture them, you cool that thing down. Cool it down to 140. And slow roast them. Yeah. Slow roast them. Let them feel the pain and the misery. 
So anyway, that didn't really make sense to me. And the fire did kill the soldiers instantly when they took them up there. Now that should have been a sign, right? I mean, you're watching them go up the side of the building, they three steps on the side, and the soldiers, in the process of throwing them in, they'd die right there on the spot. Everybody would have seen that. I mean, that would have been the first tip-off to me. Is like, wow. But anyway, these guys are walking around in the fire, and uh, it certainly didn't make any difference here because the fire didn't have no effect on them. No way. This is just an absolute plain miracle. The flame slew. Christian, Christian, I think, and I, I'm not a theologian at all, but I think there's a scriptural connotation to the fact that it was seven times because seven is such a complete number for the Holy Spirit. So sure. there's a scriptural connotation that the fire was, was driven by the Lord to some degree and his hand was already on it. So the, 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 the amount of heat was his heat, was his presence. Is that what Sure. So it was already tied to the Lord the minute he turned it up. Good, it's time. a good point. And it is in the scriptures that way. So it was there for a reason. Right? So the flame slew Satan's soldiers. So the point I want to make about that is Satan always has his soldiers. He always has his soldiers. He always has his soldiers, and they'll be firing those fiery darts. And we can list them, right? They ain't changed a bit. Lust, sex, greed, jealousy, alcohol, drugs. Am I missing any? Satan's fiery darts. He always has his soldiers. After it had been thrown in, the soldiers die instantly. Nebuchadnezzar immediately sees four and not three. So he, in verse 20, he commands the mighty men to bind them up, cast them in. So they, they were fully clothed and they were cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And um, he killed the men who took, up, took Shadrach, Meshach, and Ben to go up. And they fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. So then in verse 24, Nebuchadnezzar is astonished. And he jumps up and he says, Did we throw three? Of course, they confirm, Yeah, we threw three. And Nebuchadnezzar says, I see four. And that fourth one looks like the Son of God. Nebuchadnezzar is recognizing a pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. So what do we say about that? He's in the fire. It don't matter what the trials of life are. He's in the fire. He's in there with you. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. You see, that's a promise. And the promise isn't based on what our feelings are. It's not based on what our circumstances are. It's based on what God said. I have written right here. Evidently, I've studied this at some point in time. But I put, what if equals fear and even if equals faith? Say again? What if equals fear even if equals faith? So what if something happens to me? Well, that's fear. But even if I get burned, what if the Lord heals that I stood up for the hell I had to hold and sustain? That's exactly right. I agree with that 100%. I agree with that 100%. These three guys, though, are walking around in the fire. The soldiers done died. And they walking around in the fire. But they were bound. Now they're loosed. And now they're loosed. So here's some amazing things to point out, right? They went in with fully clothed, even had their hats on. And the only thing that burned 
Well, it's the rubbers. Their skin didn't burn. Their hair didn't burn. Their hat didn't burn. None of their clothes burned. The only thing that died, the only thing that was affected was the things of Babylon, the things of the world. The soldiers died and the ropes burned off. Those were things about everything else belonged to the boys. Everything else belonged to God. So they're not dead, they're alive. They're walking around as if they're unhurt. There's no pain. soldiers die. Nebuchadnezzar is experiencing what is called a theophany. It's a pre-incarnate appearance of Lord Jesus Christ. And um, there are several examples of this. Um, there was an example of when Moses viewed the burning bush and the bush wasn't consumed. That was, that was a theophany. That was the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Also at Sinai, at Mount Horeb, we remember the cloud by day and the fire by night. Those were the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Isaiah, we know of Jacob's uh, ladder and the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ there. Hagar had a visit from the Lord Jesus Christ. There were visions by Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. So anytime in the Old Testament that you see the phrase angel of the Lord or angel of God versus the verbiage an angel or some angel, we're talking about the angel. Not any angel, but the angel. And so the verbiage that you'll see in the Old Testament is the angel of the Lord or the angel of God. So anytime you see that phrase in the Old Testament, that's what it means. It's a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's no need for a theophany in the New Testament because Jesus Christ became a man, right? So that he could die in our place. And so he's always present with us. He's in the fire. He's in the trials. And so there's no need for a theophany in the Old Testament or the, the New Covenant. He's always present in the form of the risen Christ and by way of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so this fourth guy looked like, according to Nebuchadnezzar, the Son of God. Now some translations um, say the son of a god or a son of the gods talking about his gods so this wasn't like the son of god this was the son of god he wasn't a god he was the god mm -hmm. wow nebuchadnezzar this pagan rascal gets the opportunity to see jesus christ I don't know if he understood it at the time, but that's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. What a privilege for Nebuchadnezzar. And so you wonder if he, if he gets it now. 580 years before Jesus Christ is born, Nebuchadnezzar gets to see Jesus Christ. And he's in the fire. Now that's powerful. That, that's just plain powerful. The whole point of them three boys being thrown into the fire and Jesus walking around there with them is to give us the example and the spiritual truth that he is always with us in whatever trial we go through. Mm -hmm. It's a promise. And so what I was getting at earlier is that the problem always comes in with us. You know, we get into a, a straight or a pickle or we're in the fire and we feel abandoned. Now catch what I just said. What did I say? We feel, we feel like 
who's been abandoned. Well, that's what ought to catch our attention. Because feelings ain't got nothing to do with it. It's facts and faith. And so here's one of the things that we remember about Sunday school lessons, listen to the preacher preach, or whatever, is that the facts are plain. It's facts and faith, and feelings have got nothing to do with it. So if you're in the in a mess and you feel like God has abandoned you, that's that's your problem. He has not. And so we should take comfort in that. They're alive, they're not dead. But Satan's soldiers were. When we trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we're going to be alive. And it's going to be forever. What a privilege. What a privilege. Jesus is alive. We are alive. We are spiritually alive forever. You know, what a wonder. What a privilege. What a Savior. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we grateful? <clears throat> are we grateful? The only thing that was affected was the soldiers and the ropes on their hands. The Bible says that their hair was not even singed. The Bible says they didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. There's got to be a good spiritual application there. I like it that it may have happened and we just don't know it, but I like that it didn't amaze them. They didn't walk out. I would have walked out going, oh my gosh, you're not hurt, you're not fit. I wonder what just happened. That's the a good point, they too. They walked in in faith, and not only that, they walked out as if, I told you, yeah. and they stood. That, to me, is the honor of the process, because it is when bad things happen. Uh, obviously, um, you do fight feelings of what is God, but then when you walk through that fire, you do walk, you look back and you're able to go, God, but they are so powerful, but he never leaves us in trouble. Actually, he's more present in trouble than he is when there's not trouble. So I think you're right I about think, that too. I think yeah. in, in their minds, the fact that they were able to walk in and walk through and not even flinch, and, and, and that to me is a testament. And, and in my mind, this was before Jesus Christ. They weren't even introduced to Jesus. They were introduced to a God that they called their God. But there were other gods that other people called. Nothing like the comfort we have with Jesus and the birth of Jesus. Yeah, it could have been so certainly they were right. really faithful. Yeah. Certainly could have been. Well, there's no biblical evidence that they had met Jesus Christ before. I mean, this would be the first the first time. But let me add, add live a little bit to what Dana's point is in that we get in a trial or some tragedy happens and we say we get through it unscathed and it's, it's a miracle. I think what you're saying is like... When, says, look what I, man, I came through that and said, Lord, thank you for when, bringing me through that. When what Dana, I think, is saying is, why should we be amazed? God's powerful. Why should we be amazed when he does something miraculous? He does that. He does that. So we shouldn't be amazed. Hair's not singed. They didn't even smell like smoke. Now, they was in a fire, and certainly there was smoke boiling, and they didn't even smell like smoke. So let's put this in a, a spiritual application here. We're living in a world that I've often referred to as a cesspool. I mean, it stinks. And so here's the application. We have to live in this cesspool, but we ain't got to smell like it. We ain't got to smell like it. And if we dilly-dally around too much on the edge of the cesspool, you 
you might get some stink on you. The point for us in living in this cesspool is for us to stay as far away from it as we can. Don't put yourself in visit places that you know you shouldn't be in. Don't allow yourself to be next to something that you know is a temptation for you. I remember a story, it's a true story, way back in the days of uh, wagons and wagon trains and Wells Fargo got started as a freight, hauling freight in wagons. And they usually had, you know, 16 horse, and they would haul your freight, right? And so Wells Fargo was hiring drivers to deliver freight. And so these three guys was interviewed for this one job, and the first guy I interviewed, the owner of the company says, imagine that you're on treacherous mountain path and you know, the ledge is right there, and you get, you're going to fall, fall over. How close can you get to the edge? And this guy puffs his chest out. I'm a good driver. I can get within six inches of it. Second guy he's interviewed, and the same story, he says, I think I can get within two or three inches of it. I'm so good. The third guy comes in, he hears the same pitch, and he says, I think I'm going to stay as far close to the side of the mountain as I can. He said, you got the job. <laughs> Don't push it. You want to stay away from it, not see how close you can get to it. The only thing that, that um, was affected was, was ropes. The flame didn't hurt them. The flame done them good. The flame took the bonds off. It took what was had them bound and destroyed. Do you get that? Sometimes you got you got some bondage. You're you're bound by some sin or something, and God puts you in the fire and burns it off. And now you're free of that. That's just plain good stuff there. The flame done them good. The fire gave them liberty. They were unbound, says verse 25. They were loose. They got a new tool. They got a new witness. They've got another testimony. Can you imagine their testimony now? Yeah. Jesus was with me in the fire. What all did they have to do to get there? Obey. What do we have to do? It, nothing's changed. Uh -huh. Nothing has changed. Obedience and faith. It is impossible to please God without faith. They were unbound. It says they were loose. New tool. They are mightier now than they ever were. God has given these three boys the most powerful witness and the most powerful testimony. If they had a bow down, we wouldn't even be reading about these guys. But yet their story is still alive and, and well today and is an encouragement for us to, to this day because they stood their ground. When we're in the hottest fire, the Lord Jesus Christ is with us. And we're more conscious of Him, and I think Daniel said this too, than at any other time. When you're in the fire, you're more conscious. In the process of our personal fires, the fire will burn the bonds and set us free from that trial, and set us free from that thing that's bothering us, or that thing that has got us so troubled that thing has got us so worried. We come out liberated. Fire burned it off. He was with Moses at the burning bush, and he was with the children of Israel all through the exodus and the wandering. He was with the disciples in the midst of the storm. 
They thought they were going to lose their lives and Jesus is going to walk them out on the water. What they were afraid of was of drowning in the water. And Jesus come to them walking on top of that thing that they were scared of, the water. Jesus is on top of it. Now we just got to trust him. He's there. He's there. He was with the disciples in the midst of the storm. He was with Stephen when Stephen was stoned. Was Stephen delivered? Not physically. Mm -hmm. He died. Mm -hmm. He was stoned. These three Hebrew boys were delivered. Now God didn't keep them from the fire. But he was with them in the fire and he saw them through the fire. So what's the difference? Why is it then that God does what he does with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but Stephen dies a martyr? Well, God's got a plan and he's got a purpose. And I don't even pretend to think God's thoughts. Man, his ways is higher than my ways. His thoughts are better than my thoughts. He's with us when we grieve. <clears throat> He's with us when we're in the fire. He's the rock of ages. He's the lily of the valley and the bright morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000. Disciples survived the farm. Stephen didn't. These three boys survived the fire. And so we ask, why does God save some but not others? Why does a baby die and a murderer go free? We've been asked these questions before. Why is there so much suffering today? Why, why, why? We've all had the questions. Don't really have really good answers because we don't have the mind of God. But what we do know is this, that there is evil there is evil, but there's also a divine goodness as well. God does allow temporal suffering. That's what we observe. You cannot deny that. When someone challenges you on that, what they're trying to do is get your gut. They're trying to put you in an impossible situation that you can't defend. Why is it that a loving God allows the suffering? And somebody wants to get an answer because it's like a gotcha kind of a question. The answer is that God does allow temporal suffering. And then we, the next question we get, well, well, why does a loving God do that? Well, let's not forget he's, he's holy and righteous too. Man has free choice. And so we ask ourselves all the time, like, the news says a uh, plane goes down and 250 people die. And immediately we're like, why does God allow 250 people to die at one time? At the end of the news broadcast, the other, by the way, the pilot was drunk. Well, that's why the plane crashed. That was not God's will. The pilot was drunk. And so let's not throw away our common sense either. God's will is not always done here on earth. That's right. Now his plan and his purpose is going to be accomplished. But is it God's will that anybody go to hell? Well, no. Did he not die for everybody? Yes, he did. Well, why is it that some are going to go to hell? Because they choose to. Will God send someone to hell? No. So you do that on your own. Did God create hell for you? No, he did not. He created it for Satan. And Satan hates you to the point that he wants to take you with him. And that's why we got evil in the world. Because man has 
a choice. Man's got a choice. He does allow temporal suffering, and we don't understand all of it. Don't try, don't even try to explain stuff like that. It can't be done. We don't have the mind of God. But you got to view suffering with eternity in mind. God's divine goodness shows us how to conquer suffering, even in spite of suffering. Verses 26 to 30, Nebuchadnezzar and all his people see that these three Hebrew boys are totally unharmed by the fire. And the fire was seven times hotter than it's normally heated. They're speechless. Except Nebuchadnezzar. There's no evidence that any of the Chaldeans said a word. But they were certainly quick to point out that these three boys had defied the king, didn't they? They died for cover now. Listen, you be obedient and live by faith, and your challengers and your enemies will die for cover. Mm -hmm. eventually they won't be able to stand it you got to do your part though. they got nothing to say when God's power is expressed the fire had no power and this is an interesting phrase the fire god of the Chaldeans was Marduk Bel and he was a high god, and he was also one of Nebuchadnezzar's favorite gods. And that's spelled M-A-R-D-U-K-B-E-L, Marduk, Bell. And so he was a high god on the scale. But the point of all this is, is that Murdoch, the fire god, was not able to destroy the three Hebrew boys. The fire slew the soldiers that didn't have any effect on these three boys, not even their clothes. But it did destroy the ropes. And the soldiers and the ropes belonged to the Babylonian Empire. The only things that were destroyed, God's powerful. So here's the point about this. God also controls nature and natural phenomena. The fire didn't affect these boys because God, I mean, it was a miracle. Now, all kinds of uh, liberal theologians have tried to explain away how it was, it was in a pocket and they really wasn't exposed to the heat and on and on they go trying to explain away the miracle. But the fact remains here is that the soldiers that took them up were killed instantly so why weren't they killed? Why weren't the three boys killed instantly right there on the spot? That's what the Bible says. Now this is a miracle of God. The fire didn't have any power on them because God changed the physics. The thing is, you get around a campfire. Yeah. I'm not saying get right here and stand right next to it, but you can be off over yonder. When you go home, you can smell that smoke on it. Yeah, you get blistered from it too. Yeah, you get, you get in there too close to it, you're going to get burned. It's going to hurt. But as far as the smell and everything like that, you can't get around it. But here, they didn't even smell it. When it comes to natural phenomena, fire, wind, volcanoes, <coughs> earthquakes, God's in total control of all that. God can cause a tornado to tear a whole town down and, and a church building to survive. I mean, God's powerful. God controls everything. He controls all the forces of nature. They're all at the touch of the hand of God. 
by their faith they quench the violence of the fire and this is nothing but a miracle of a powerful almighty God but that's not the only miracle here it's not natural that they would submit to this human injustice without saying a word Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out of that trial. There's no boasting. There's no flipping off. There's no arrogance. That's a miracle. God puts us through some kind of a trial. Don't go boasting about like you're some super spiritual saint and that's why God uh-uh, uh-uh. That's a dangerous, dangerous game to play. There's absolutely no evidence here that even due to this human injustice, they didn't say a word. There's not word, not one word of um, boasting. Even before they go into the fire, there's no begging. <clears throat> there's no pleading. There's no nothing. They, they didn't build a case for their release. I mean, you're in those positions of power and influence and all the good things. You, you, could, be, you could hear, we could make up a story and say, now, now Ned, we, we've been doing a good job here now. Surely that's, that counts for something. I mean, but there's no begging. There's no pleading, there's no bargaining, and there's nothing on the other side of the fire, like <laughs> Toast said, boasting and being arrogant. That's a miracle. That's a miracle in and of itself. When you get, when you get squeezed, whatever's inside of you is going to come out. Usually. When a face full of faith, it just come out. No showboating, no taunting, no vindictive spirit. Now sometimes we're real good at that. Like we get in a mess, and then God does see us through it, and then we're like, <clears throat> God vindicated me, it's you next, boy. You, you, get, you got what's coming to you. you, you you're going to get yours. That, that's just not good Christian spiritual talk, y'all. Mm -hmm. That's being boastful. That's being arrogant. That, that's, that's almost like, like I'm, I'm such a spiritual giant that God does this for me, but He ain't going to do it for you. I mean, your implication there is I'll just get God to do something to you. Like you can command God to do something. Now that's just plain arrogance. But there's nothing like that in these three boys, before or after. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. But we can do this. We, we can be that miracle for others watching. Your Christian character, what does it say about how we handle the trial and how we come out of it? No showboat. No toning, no vindictive spirit. There's no language of personal triumph here. They didn't give in to that garbage. That's not the Christian way. That's just as miraculous as their faith. The conduct in this whole episode is just supernatural. Can we do supernatural stuff? Surely we can. The Holy Spirit of God lives on the inside. And we can't do stuff on our own. But when we trust Him and we're doing it right, we are being obedient, we're in God's will, the Holy, that Holy Spirit will be with us. And it won't matter if, if we do go into the fire. It won't even matter if He slays us. What did Job say? After he lost his wealth, he lost his health, he lost his whole family. And he said, though he slay me, 
though he slay me, I will still trust him. That's faith. That's faith. <clears throat> How can we get through the fiery furnace trials of day? Same way they did. It's because we know God and God knows us. That's how. That's how we get through any kind of a trial. Because we know God. He's with us in the fire. There were representatives from the entire Babylonian Empire present at the dedication of this golden image. And none of these had anything to say about this miracle. So just get this picture now. The Babylonian Empire was from India to the Mediterranean Sea, east to west. And it was from Egypt to Turkey, Asia Minor, from south to north. We're talking about a vast, all these peoples, all these nations, all these different nationalities, and everybody had to come to the dedication, right? Everybody was there. They got a world stage. Don't you know that all these people went home to their different nations and their different tribes and tongues and whatever and they told this story. You see what kind of influence you can have when we do it God's way when we're obedient and we're faithful. What a testimony these guys have. They've got the most powerful testimony the world will ever see at the time. They go into a fire and they come out unscathed. And they give God credit. And this story just gets spreads to the whole empire. You never know what kind of influence. You never know what kind of testimony that you're having with somebody. And what the repercussions might be. Good or bad. Because of the courage and faith of these three boys... A loud mouth, proud, vain, arrogant king was, was led to praise the God of heaven and acknowledge that no God can deliver by that. Nebuchadnezzar said, Who's the God that can deliver you out of my hand? In other words, Nebuchadnezzar was saying, I don't know who this God is, y'all serve, but I'm bigger than him. That's what Nebuchadnezzar said. Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm God. Mm -hmm. Who, who's stronger than I am? Loud mouth, proud, vain, arrogant king was led to praise the God of heaven and acknowledge that no God can deliver like this. Well, Nebuchadnezzar got his answer. <laughs> the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Before our time on earth is done, we may well be called to make some sacrifice and to take a stand for God. And it may cost us. We have to at least consider what that might look like and what, what are we going to say? What are we going to do? So Daniel and these three boys had purposed in their heart, right? Right up front. They had done made up their mind. And so we too, that God, if there's some trial out there that I'm going to face, I'm going to let it be known right now that I'm going to stand with you. Making up my mind right now that when, when that comes, I've already got my answer. The three Hebrew boys said, we ain't got to think about this. Mm -mm. They didn't even wax spiritual, did they? Let us have a committee meeting. <laughs> let us, let us, give us just a minute. We'll huddle up here, just three. We'll, we'll pray about it. I like that one. They was already prayed up. 
they was already prayed up. Listen, there's some things you don't have to pray about. That's right. God, you want me to do right? Yeah. You ain't got to pray about that. Nominating committee is going to be working here before long. And I'm only going to make this statement like this. Does God want everybody at Walkerville to do something, to serve in some capacity? The answer is yes. yes. Do you have to pray about that? No. Nominating committee comes to me and says, John Ed, you going to teach your Sunday school class? Let me think about that. Let me go home and pray about that. Wrong, wrong, wrong. God called me to teach 40-something years ago. As far as I know, he ain't changed his mind. It would be wrong for us to pray for certain things. You don't have to pray about doing right. The time for surface faith and cowardly Christians are quickly coming to an end. Being a Christian may cost more than many are willing to pay. So we have to ask ourselves the question, are we willing to stand for our faith? Will we have the courage, will we have the faith to say that we will honor God no matter what? Even if you're by yourself. I'm out of time, but let me end with this just one thing. When they come to making up their mind about obeying God or Nebuchadnezzar, they went with God. Mm -hmm. God's laws are the only lasting laws. Those are the only laws that's going to stand the test of time. That'll help us make up our mind. Right? God's laws are going to last. Man's laws are Lord, thank you for this class. I thank you for your attendance, your attention, your input. And Lord, I pray that we would all be better for having come and heard your word proclaimed. God, help us to apply it so that a lost world can see there is a difference and they'd want what we have. And that's the joy and the peace and the comfort and the happiness that comes with knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Also, next week, we're going to be, David Nezra has another dream. And so we'll see what interesting thing comes out of that.